I am so tired of hearing that the Fallout TV show is finally a good video game adaptation. Maybe we just need more of this specific flavor like Fallout, which according to the team behind it, felt more like a new game, more like a Fallout 5 than an adaptation of any of the original source material pieces. And I don't disagree. The story that the show was able to tell was exactly different enough while holding the best pieces of the games together pretty well. It was kind of a perfect video game adaptation, whether or not it was a perfect show. What I appreciated most about the show is that it gave us a chance to do something that the games simply never could. It never once crashed on me. I'm kidding. I'm talking about the way that we were able to finally step out of the Vault Dweller's shoes and into the persona of some other characters. It was refreshing, but it still captured the spirit of the loss of innocence that the games cover really well, in my opinion. This theme is an echo of the lives that we walk as people of faith, and it also points towards our continued problems as well. So what could a show about a post-apocalyptic future possibly have to do with the actual origin of humanity and the creation account? Let's talk about it. Folks, welcome to Checkpoint Church, where nerds, geeks, and gamers come together to talk about faith, games, and look, I am a simple man. I see Walton Goggins, I watch the show. Hello there. I'm here to show you a wonderful place. What the f would you know about where I'm from? I'm your nerd pastor, Nate. If you like these weekly deep dives, you should sub, hit that bell, and find out when our next one drops. Folks, as always, we're we'll starting with our scripture for this one. Our liturgist is from level two, Sneaky Pig. We'll be reading from the NRSVUE. That's our preferred translation. So it's going to be up on the screen. If you have a translation you prefer, feel free to use that one as well. The passage today is from the very first book, Genesis chapter three, verses 22 through 24. And the Lord God said, See, the humans have become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now they might reach out their hands and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent them forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which they were taken. He drove out the humans, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. Skeptical as to how that verse can apply, me too. What is Fallout all about anyways? Fallout is a franchise that found its footing in role-playing video games created for the PC by Tim Kaine and Leonard Boyarsky at Interplay Entertainment, later taken over by Bethesda with a game produced by Obsidian and some little spinoffs here and there. The series itself spans a few different eras, being set predominantly in the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd centuries. It envisions a slightly revisioned history of the US where the society became pretty obsessed with 1950s US technology, resulting in what the creators refer to as an atomic punk retrofuturistic setting, which is very fun the more you think about all those words and how they play together. It also has led to the aesthetic of this game being downright perfect and having one of the best OSTs of any game ever. I listen to those cringy jams unironically at this point. The typical journey of the Fallout game puts the player into the shoes of a vault dweller. These are folks who were fortunate enough to have a vault to turn to when the bombs dropped that would keep them safe. Now I'm speaking to you from deep inside the fully livable model 96 JQ 1164. And what a beaut she is. Generations have passed within that vault. Now this corridor here is Sycamore Street, where you'll wave howdy to any one of your 200 neighbors on your way home for an enchanted evening with your loved ones. And so these dwellers have literally never experienced a world outside of their perfectly kept homestead. A veritable Camelot, the nuclear age. For some reason, the game contrives, usually involving water or a family member, or sometimes a miraculous survival of a gunshot to the cranium, the Vault Dweller must leave the space of safety and go on an epic adventure around the wasteland or whatever area of the US their vault happens to be in. Love or hate the writing and storytelling of Bethesda and the like, the Fallout lore really shines in the light of the loss of innocence of the Vault Dweller, leaving the home base and going out into the world. Can you tell me what's happened in the last 200 years? In Fallout 3, one of the first decisions that you have to make outside of your vault is whether or not to arm a nuke in a town called a Megaton for some major coinage at the expense of a few dozen strangers who will almost certainly die. The game practically begs you from the outset to make a powerful moral decision right from the get-go, where your vault dweller has no real concept of morality beyond the vault at this point. The games in the series will continue to pitch you these decisions, but the choices will get consistently more challenging and nuanced. What is right and what is wrong become muddier and muddier, and they allow for a really compelling ability to create a nuanced character in the form of your protagonist that you're playing as. The show explores these same questions with Elle Purnell being our main character and most central of the big three. I am. She plays Lucy, who is a vault dweller, that has her wedding day seriously ruined by the unexpected takeover from Raiders in the vault next door where her husband came from. Her dad is taken from her. Remember, I mentioned that a family member often is the reason that the vault dweller must leave the vault. I should have bet my bottle caps on that one. This premise sets up the show to explore many of the same questions as the game. 
recently on a podcast on Fallout by friends of Checkpoint Church, Crossfire of Faith and Gaming, Reverend David Petty actually notes this. You're playing as a vault dweller, right? And and you've been brought up in this world of rules. And in the in the TV show, you follow along with a vault dweller. And she has this very clear sense of moral right and wrong, right? It's like, you know, killing people is wrong. Like very clearly, like, this is the end, of, you know, it's like clear line. And she encounters these, these points at which she has to struggle with like, well, okay, but this person might kill me and maybe, you know, you can't just trust everybody. Maybe there is a time where you have to decide between yourself and someone else. And, and there were many of times I remember in the games where, yeah, you had to make choices like that. It's like, do you kill this character or do you not? Do you follow this character or do you not? This is what I mean by the loss of innocence in the story. In fact, later in that podcast episode, one of David's co-hosts, Russ, remarks on Eden. Almost that kind of perfect Eden view of what humanity is supposed to be like and that there is no bad in the world. And there is no evil. And there is no, you know, all that. It's clear from what both of these fine fellas is saying that there is an illusion here worth noting. The vault being Eden and the wasteland being everything outside of it. So if the illusion is there, why not explore it? Let's look at our scripture for this one. You likely know the start of this story here. This is the second creation account, and this one goes into considerably more detail on the fall of humanity and Adam and Eve and the fruit and all that good stuff. The fruit's been ate, and now the consequences are being doled out. The serpent had promised that the two's eyes might be opened, and opened they were, but not to the idyllic image they had uh, supposed it would be. Instead, it was one distorted and filled with shame. Upon confessing their error, the Lord God is faced with the predicament of what to do next. Acknowledging in the text that they have now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Because of that, they must not be allowed to take from the tree of life and live forever. And so the Lord God banishes the two from the Garden of Eden and places a cherubim with a flaming sword to guard the way. Pretty metal. As Christians, it's helpful to try and frame the Old Testament and the writings, oral stories, and myths of the Israelites from the perspective of the bigger picture that's being painted here. So it's less important like how the separation of God and man happened and more important that it has happened. All of this is looking back on the history of where the nation of Israel had come from. So these stories are meant as warnings, teachings, guidance on how the nation of Israel might best progress as the people of God. But then there's us. We're Christians, Gentiles. We're thousands of years out. We're not the Israelites. We're not the intended audience of these stories at all, or at least we weren't until we became a part of the narrative. However, just because we're late additions to the party doesn't mean that the story is not exceptionally well connected to the story being woven by God through Christ. The cherubim that is guarding the garden is a part of the New Testament as well. And you may have missed it. When Jesus is being crucified in the passion narrative, just as he dies, something major happens. There is a veil which is torn in the temple. And this veil happens to be a symbolic depiction of the cherubim that was carried from Eden into the Ark of the Covenant into the Holy of Holies that separated God from humanity within the temple. This this was where humanity was separated from God, only allowing the permitted priests to even enter into this presence. And then with Jesus' sacrifice, the veil is torn, the presence of God is made manifest in and through and with all. This is vitally important to our illusion here because this is where the parallel begins to break down for the Fallout and Eden narrative. So. In Fallout, the developers are having you play with morality from the perspective of a blank slate human being. The Vault Dweller departs from this Edenic existence and goes out into the world, never able to return to that place ever again. In the same way, Adam and Eve are forced from their own innocence, arguably from the consumption of the fruit, but then that reality is made physical in the cherubim blocking the path to return to that place of perfection. The Vault Dweller goes on a journey of self-discovery, discerning right from wrong, making tough decisions, and often making mistakes. So too, the descendants of Adam and Eve are on a journey of self-discovery, trying to define their role as God's people again and again, trying to discern right from wrong, consistently making tough decisions and often mistakes. But this is where the parallel breaks down. No matter what the vault dweller does, there's no going back. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. You can't close Pandora's box. The story only goes forward. You either live long enough to die a hero or become the villain, as the phrasing goes. But the story of the Christian is one that doesn't follow the rules of reality. It transcends reality by comprehension only made possible by a god. The mystery of the cherubim blocking the way is that the cherubim can be removed. The way to God can be reopened and the path to grace is radically possible. 
The vault is a man-made perfection. The vault dweller only thinks they're living in perfection, whereas Eden truly was oneness with God, and the incorruptible God remains available. The path just had to be cleared and atoned. And so cleared it was with Jesus, and in atonement, the veil was torn, sin was defeated, death was conquered, the slate was wiped clean, and the connection with God was opened. But with all of this in mind, what does this actually mean for us Today, this all sounds like history. Well, stories like Fallout are exceptional because they allow us to play with the possibilities of morality. We're able to see the good and the bad of Lucy when she peruses the wasteland. We're able to feel empathy for Maximus as he discovers the Brotherhood of Steel aren't all they're cracked up to be. We get to, uh, you know, actually the ghoul was just kind of cool the entire time, you know, the whole broken person trope, it just, it never fails to land. These are good playgrounds, but the reality of the situation is that there's no happy ending truly available in our human comprehension of living and atonement and repentance. For the Christian, these stories are examples of the goodness of God because there is a truth that transcends our nihilistic belief. Grace abides beyond our deepest skepticism and it's freely given. We don't have to travel the wasteland. We don't have to steal, kill, and destroy. We only have to let go and refocus on the way of loving God and loving neighbor as Christ taught us. A whole lot more peaceful of a situation to the alternative. Now, Naysayers might still argue that this is an unrealistic way of living life. And yeah, fair enough. Grace is unrealistic. That's why the stories that Jesus told are still impacting and still challenging the ideals of our most modern society. And thankfully, we don't have to have it all figured out. That is what makes it faith. So if you're interested in figuring it out alongside a bunch of nerds who are playing these kind of games and watching these kinds of shows as a means to grow our faith and to have confidence in something greater, then know that whether you're a vault dweller, a ghoul, or an atom bomb, baby little atom bomb, you're always welcome here at Checkpoint Church. Folks, thank you so much for watching this one. I so appreciate you taking time out of your busy days to join us on these nerdy deep dives. If you want more of what Checkpoint Church has to offer, we are streaming over on Twitch every other Sunday, every Tuesday, and every Friday. If you want more right here, right now, we are on Discord 24 seven in community. I would love to have you in either of those spaces down below. Hey, listen, if you believe in our mission to serve nerds, geeks, and gamers, then please consider using our Give to Checkpoint Church link in the description. If you consider Checkpoint your church, consider setting up a tithe there as well. Maybe you don't consider Checkpoint to be your church or you're a part of a small group and you want to use these sermons as a sort of landing page to have a discussion around some of our favorite things. We've been creating curriculum specifically for you. You can go to jesuslovesnerds.com and find our curriculum for this sermon as well as plenty of others. Folks, if you liked this one, and odds are you did if you watched this far, be sure to click that thumbs up button. Let me know that this is one that you made it this far. In. If you're looking for others to watch just like this one, I'll do a real throwback to Eden, that cell shaded uh, anime that we covered back in our very first season. Uh, you know, it may be a rough watch, but it was a really good show and it fits the theme perfectly. Or you can go watch one of our other uh, TV show based nerdy sermons, t -Lu. You can always watch The Last of Us. We have two of those there for you to watch. I'll just let Nikki choose whichever one to put there. Uh, and that's just in honor of another exceptional video game TV adaptation. Or you can go watch our one on Xenoblade Chronicles 3, which feels like a far cry from this one, but this one really deals with how we ought to live our lives once we realize that the slate has been wiped clean. Let me know if you check any of those out. Hey, quick question for you. If you could pick any game series to get a TV show adaptation, what would it be? Let me know down in the comments down below. And if you want to see my response, be sure to look down there for Nerd Pastor Nate. With that, we're going to end this one as we always do with our three things that we believe to be true about every single one of you out there. Whether you believe in God, don't believe in God, go to church, don't go to church, hate God or hate church, we still believe these three things to be true about every single one of you out there. Number one, that God loves you, like really, really loves you. Number two, we love you, we want community with you, that's why we're doing this. Number three, believe that you, yes, you matter. You're a person of sacred worth. The world's a better place. Why? Because you are in it. Folks, with that, until the next time, that I see ya. Bye bye! That was a loud one. <laughs> bye bye! You have key. You have the key. Use the key. I just need, I need to know. I need to know what am I doing? Where do the key go? It must go somewhere. And I got the key, but now I can't do anything with it. Was there a door over here? I don't feel like there was. There was, and it's got the blue thing. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. The greatest gamer, the greatest gamer can solve it. If there's a problem, yo, I'll solve it.